So, good morning. I'm going to start the uh, lecture today with one method, or shall I say a little trick um, rather than a method that deals with um, boundary value problem in a different system of coordinates than the Cartesian coordinates. So remember what I told you in class before that when we move to other uh, coordinate systems like the cylindrical or spherical coordinates, uh, you will see that the uh, whole um, problem changes dramatically because the eigenvalue problem, also known as the Sturmwilm problem, is actually different. Not only it's different, but uh, you kind of have to take uh, an entire chapter to discuss how to solve the, that, uh, that new eigenvalue problem. So if you remember up until this point, our um, Sturmwilm problems, our eigenvalue problems were of the form x double prime uh, plus lambda big x equals zero. Uh, with various boundary conditions, um, and then the eigenvalues typically involve sine and cosine functions, the eigenfunctions, sorry. So, in fact, as a brief um, um, review of the main concepts, let's, let's just rem remember one of the, one heat equation, a type of heat equation we studied before. Uh, I'm not going to go over all the steps, but just to just to establish the basics so if you have a heat equation uh, in the standard form let's say u partial t equals a squared u partial x x uh, and then suppose that the uh, this is one dimensional heat equation right so suppose that the um, heated bar that um, uh, whose temperature is described by this equ equation is of length pi which is kind of the easiest interval um, related to the Fourier series so that means uh, x is between 0 and pi, and the time greater than 0. And remember that u, the temperature, depends uh, on the location on the bar and the time, so u of xt. And so suppose that you have uh, homogeneous boundary conditions of the Dirichlet type, so prescribed temperatures at the, uh, equal to 0 at endpoints. That means u of 0 t, u of pi t equals 0. And some initial temperature, which is... Um, Let's, let's keep it unspecified at this point. So u of x0 equals to some function of x. So remember, you deal with that non-homogeneous condition right at the end after, after you do the superposition principle. So we got, without going through all the details, um, when you do the separation of variables method uh, for this problem, so remember that in this case, the um, Sturmwilm problem ends up being x double prime plus lambda x equals 0 with the boundary conditions x of 0, x of pi equals 0, and the eigenvalues will be uh, lambda n equals n squared, and then um, the eigenfunctions x sub n uh, will be, in this case, um, sine of nx. Um, then the initial value, um, the initial um, value problem in the temperature, right? So the temperature problem for this um, boundary value problem will be um, T prime uh, plus A squared lambda equals zero. And then remember you solve the initial value problem for each um, eigenvalue, lambda N. So that's A squared uh, lambda T, sorry about that, equals zero. <coughs> So if you substitute lambda with lambda n, you have t prime plus a squared um, n squared big T equals zero with the solution tn of little t uh, given by a n e to the minus n a squared t. <clears throat> so this should be familiar to you. Uh, and remember, it's very important to keep in mind the conventions of notations here. I mean, once you plug in the eigenvalue, uh, uh, lambda n equals n squared, then the solution will be labeled Tn as well, because you don't actually solve a single initial value problem. You solve uh, an initial value problem for each of the eigenvalues that you found when you solved the uh, Sturmwilm problem or the eigenvalue problem. Um, again, at this point, you may pause a little bit and look back on the notes if you need a refresher of, on the main concepts of the separation of variables. Once you deal with uh, finishing this, uh, this part of the problem, then the superposition principle follows. Um, 
meaning that you assemble a solution in the form of a series, which is, in this case, the summation from um, 1 to infinity. I forgot to mention here that n is from 1, 2, 3, and so on, so 1 to infinity. Um, a n e to the minus n a squared t sine of n x. So your solution looks in the series format. The only stuff to be established yet is the value of these constants a n. And this is the time when you actually impose the initial condition in the problem, in this case, the initial temperature, and a n will come from a Fourier representation of f x. So I feel that also uh, from grading your exams, some people are still confused with the logic of the, um, the whole method here. So make sure during the office hours you actually ask questions if, if there's still something not clear about the overall method. Because again, we're going to follow this method from uh, this point until the end of the course. The only difference is that eigenvalues and um, eigenfunctions will be different in, in different contexts. Um, so um, like I said, at the end, at the, at the last step, when you impose the condition u of x 0 equals f of x, that means t is replaced by 0. So e to the 0 becomes 1. And so you match a Fourier sine series um, with the given function. So then a n will come from a sine series for f of x which again, usually we get it from the table, uh, or if we don't have the table, then we have to use the formula for computing the series, I'm mean, sorry, the, um, um, the Fourier coefficients in terms of integrals. That was just a refresher. So section 41 gives you a little trick on how to actually reduce a problem which is not stated in Cartesian coordinates but can be reducible uh, to a problem in Cartesian coordinates. Now, this little trick doesn't work all the time, uh, but it's so simple that it's worthwhile to know. I mean, remember, on pretty much any method we're going to learn, it has limitation in terms of uh, when it's going to be applicable or not. And this, this one actually has some subtle limitations. We'll talk about that later. But it's still easy enough and worthwhile to pursue, um, to, to go over it. So in particular, we're going to talk about a heat equation um, in a sphere and using the notation in the textbook um, let's imagine that the object is in the shape of a sphere and then the radius of that object is between 0 and pi again I'm going to use the interval 0 pi just to make it easy with when it comes to um, writing down the solution you know finding the eigenvalues and the eigenfunctions, although, remember, we can adjust it to any interval. Um, and to keep the problem easier, let's assume that the temperature flows across the radius, so in a radial fashion, but it doesn't depend otherwise on the location, um, excuse me, on the, um, on the angle coordinates. Because remember, the spherical coordinates, there's three of them, right? It's the radius, I mean, the distance from the center, and then there are two angles, one with the projection of the point on the x-y plane uh, and the other one measured with the z-axis. So let's say the temperature only depends uh, on the position along the radius, um, which leaves the problem still in two variables, right? So then <clears throat> remember the Laplacian in the spherical coordinates, right? So typically when you write your heat equation, um, as you normally do, remember the sh one notation for the Laplacian is given by the symbol, which is in Cartesian coordinates just uxx, like before. In the spherical coordinates, um, so this equation in spherical coordinates, again, assuming that my temperature depends only on the radius and on the time, as I mentioned before, um, looks like this. So ut equals a squared um, u partial r twice plus 2 over r u partial r. So this is the heat equation in the spherical coordinates under these assumptions. And let's establish some boundary conditions as well. Um, so, so and let's do um, directly type of conditions. So suppose um, u of pi 
uh, T, so the temperature on the edge of the sphere is going to be zero. And you should notice here that actually that's all I need to establish here. Sometimes there are these subtle uh, points to be made in different coordinates, but you don't actually need to specify a condition at the center of the sphere. And think about in terms of the physical setting of the problem. So let's say I have an initial temperature and uh, throughout the sphere. So the initial temperature, suppose it's equal to R squared, just to make it simple. It could be any function of R. So u of r0 equals, let's say, r squared. So that's the initial temperature in the object. Um, and then I maintain um, that the edge of the sphere is kept at temperature 0. So from a physical perspective, I don't need to specify anything beyond that. right? I mean, the temperature will flow toward the center or away from the center, depending on, of course, uh, on the temperature gradient. But I mean, I don't need to specify at the point on the center um, anything because um, um, that's all you need, basically, the, what happens at the edge of the sphere, which is not the case in the, in the horizontal bar, right? So if you have a horizontal bar, let's say this is the heat equation in one dimension, this pen, uh, because the heat flows from left and right in both directions, you kind of need to specify what happens at both ends of the object. Here, um, the boundary of the object is not made of two points, like in the case of a single up, like in the case of a rod, but the boundary of the object is the entire surface of the sphere, which is completely described by the condition u of pi t equals zero. There are some continuity assumptions, as always, and in, in terms of um, some assumptions you can make on the um, what happens at zero. We'll talk about that later in, in a different context, but Again, we don't need to specify any um, condition on the temperature in the center. So without further ado, we're going to write again on the second slide uh, or page this equation. Um, the little trick is, in this case, to make a substitution which will reduce this problem to the one we did before in um, Cartesian coordinates. So the substitution um, is going to be Basically, let's actually indicate this one here, and we're going to continue the whole um, um, lesson in a second part. But the substitution would be basically to take an associated function, big U of RT equals little r times small u of RT. This is because once you actually differentiate it twice, you will notice that you will obtain the Laplacian in um, spherical coordinates and the corresponding equation in big U will be actually identical to the one in Cartesian coordinates. So we're going to see on the second part how this works. But again, as a cliffhanger, the main idea is to make a substitution to construct a problem in a different variable, big U of RT, which is equal to little r times um, little U of RT, your original temperature um, for the sphere.